Father God, as we open up our hearts and open up your word this morning, I pray, oh God, you would help us today that we would glean something from Solomon's life, oh God, that we could apply to our daily lives. Father, as Keith sang that song a few moments ago, the incredible words and what they mean to each one of us here today. Oh God, thank you that you forgive, but you also forget. And God, as we look at Solomon's life and realized how he once started his life, the path that he veered off into, but then he came back to the straight and narrow path. And Father, today as we pause to reflect upon his learnings of life, I pray that you would instill within the heart of each one of us, oh God, what you would have us to be and do in our daily lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. It's, uh, a few moments ago as I looked out over the sanctuary and I saw people with the hymn books and I thought, what a great, precious sight. Uh, one of my very favorite uh, churches is down in Florida, and on Sunday night after we leave here, I watch that on television. But young people, it's on a college campus, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that attend that church. But the one thing I've noticed, they use the hymnal. And uh, the hymnal they use, all of those college students, like you were doing this morning, they were singing from the hymnal. Now, there are contemporary songs in their hymnal, but then there are also the wonderful hymns of the faith that are there. And as I looked out over the sanctuary this morning, I think I saw more people singing today than I've seen in many a day. And I love hearing the rustling of the pages. You know, we have uh, somewhat gotten lax in our society today, especially in churches, when people would bring their Bible and we'd open our Bibles, and now we've got screens and we use all of these modern gadgets and um, technology. But sometimes I think that we lose a lot by not thumbing through the pages of God's Word and remembering where the various books of the Bible are. Well, young people, for the past, uh, this is the seventh Sunday I've been preaching uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you want to know how to live life, if you want to know how to be a, a good parent in life, if you want to know how uh, to be a good steward in life, if you want to know how to be a good servant in life, if you want to know how to live life to the max and live life to the best, I want you to know God's Word is the greatest book in all of the world. And I want you to know it's still the number one bestseller in all of the world. And uh, this morning as we come to chapter 8 in the book of Ecclesiastes, young people, you will remember when we started out our series uh, some seven weeks ago, Solomon was King David's son in the Old Testament. Solomon would take the throne of the nation of Israel after his father David died. And so Solomon realized what an incredible responsibility God had placed into his hands. Solomon realized that that early in his life, that if he was going to live up to the expectations that God wanted him to be as a leader in a place of ruling and a place of authority, then he would need direction from Almighty God. Solomon prayed, <clears throat> and Solomon asked God for wisdom and for knowledge to lead God's people. And because Solomon asked for that, and because God said Solomon didn't ask for wealth and riches and long life, God blessed Solomon with wealth untold, and uh, he blessed him with a long life. Solomon was a young man. He started out in all the right ways, following God with his life. God had told Solomon not to get out there into the culture of his day, <clears throat> pardon me, 
and to uh, get involved in all of the paganistic uh, ways and the heathenistic idolatry that was going on and to not intermarry in, uh, with those people because God knew that it would turn Solomon's heart in the wrong direction. Solomon veered off the wrong path. When Keith call or text me this week to ask, do you have a song that would be good to go with the message today? The very first song that I thought of and all the many that Keith sings that I love, uh, but I thought about this song by Gordon Moe that uh, Keith had sung back a, a while back. And that song so expresses today, I think, the message that I want to get across to us from the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is God can make a difference in your life. If this world could only wake up this morning and understand and realize that if people of this world would turn in faith to the God of heaven who came out of heaven's glory to be born as a baby down in Bethlehem and then to die on a cross and to shed his blood to cover our sins, as the song said, where he not only forgives, but he forgets. If the world would believe that, if the world would do that, let me tell you, you and I would live in a whole different world than what we live in this morning. Let me tell you, there are some things that I want to share about Solomon's life. When you have peace with God and the peace of God that we get through Jesus Christ, your past is erased. Your present can be enjoyable and your future will be secure and eternal. The first thing that I want to talk about this morning from chapter 8, Solomon delved off into life, got on the wrong path, experienced everything there was out there in his ancient known world. He experienced the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, all of those things. One of the things I love about God's Word is that the Bible just exposes everything for the way it is. It records all of the good. It records the bad. It tells us about humanity, how we truly are, that we're all flawed, that we're all broken, that we're all born into a world filled with sin. Uh, because of Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden. And there are none of us here this morning that are perfect. We are imperfect people. And we all have flaws. And we all have sin in our life. But I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful that God can make a difference in someone's life. If they will reach out through faith and receive him as their Lord and Savior. There in your bulletin for this morning, let me give you the first point. It won't be up on the screen. But as we look at uh, what Solomon is describing in chapter 8 here in verse 1, we see, first of all, the wisdom of man. The wisdom of man. Young people, there is a godly wisdom, and then there is a secular wisdom humanistic wisdom, and the most of the world this morning is operating on an ungodly, humanistic uh, wisdom. It's a secular wisdom that leaves God out, that wants nothing to do with God whatsoever. And so Solomon describes in chapter 8, verse number 1, he says, "'Who is like a wise man?' And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom, notice, makes his face shine. And the sternness of his face is changed. What Solomon is speaking about there, he's speaking about your countenance, your facial expression. And so we see the wisdom of man, uh, the expression of his face there in your bulletin, the expression of his face. You see, real wisdom, godly wisdom will shine in your and my face 
to a world that so desperately needs what we have because real wisdom, I believe, drives a person to God. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, Solomon records these words, the fear of the Lord. In young people, that word fear means respect. We've lost respect in this world for God. And uh, there is no respect. And we're told here in God's Word that the fear of the Lord is what? It's the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now Solomon would look out at the world today where you and I live, and the world would say, Solomon would say, there's a lot of fools out there. Because fools despise wisdom and instruction. Notice what Job said in Job chapter 28, verse 28. And to man, he said, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 5, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. These scriptures tell us uh, what makes the difference in a person when they know God in a personal way. God will make your face to shine through the struggles and all of the challenges that we go through in life. Uh, God will make your face shine uh, through your sorrows. And uh, this morning, all over the world, people are grief-stricken in all kinds of ways. But let me tell you, when you've got God in your heart, you know there's a greater day coming someday. And even through our sorrows, our faces can shine with the radiance of the hope of eternity and uh, to one day be joined together with our loved ones and friends for all eternity. And then he will cause your face to shine even during the times of sickness. In the book of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13, Solomon said, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I can remember several years ago, I was walking the halls of one of the hospitals, and uh, I uh, visited a lady uh, who was probably around the age of 40. She had been given a terminal diagnosis in her life. She realized that life was of the essence. She realized that time was fleeting. The moments were passing. And as I walked into her room and began to talk with her, I can still see her to this day. And that's been 10 years ago at least. She was smiling as I walked in. And as we talked and uh, she looked at me and she said, Randy, do you see that room right across the hall from where I'm lying in my bed? And I said, yes. And she said, you know, I'm going to close my eyes one of these days. And she said, it'll be just like walking out of this room into the next. She said, I know where I'm going. And even in the midst of her dying moments. She had a countenance on her face that surpassed all human understanding. Let me tell you, the Bible tells that a man's wisdom makes his face shine. Wisdom drives you to God. And Solomon tells us that the wisdom of man is seen in the expression on his face. The expression on his face will reveal Jesus out there to a world that so desperately needs Jesus and forgiveness and everlasting life. Solomon said a man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. You see, the wisdom of man is seen not only on the expression of his face, but there in your bulletin, also on the expression of his faith. Solomon mentions the expression of a man's faith, a wise man's faith. He says man's wisdom is expressed in, first of all, his determination. What he's determined. Look in verse number one. Do not take your stand 
for an evil thing. Do not take your stand for an evil thing. Young people, if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is going to let you know immediately if something is right or if something is wrong. And Solomon said, do not take your stand for an evil thing. You've got to make a determination in your heart. Where will you stand? Let me tell you, in our world today, if Christians do not stand up for that which is right, then we'll fall for anything. And there's all kinds of things out there that uh, we need to take a, a stand on. And we need to stand for God's word and for God's biblical principles. So oftentimes we find ourselves and we're afraid if we take a stand, then we will offend someone. But folks, let me tell you, the one person I don't want to offend is God Almighty. I, I, I want to be true to him, don't you? Now, even though I know I'm flawed, even though I know I'm a broken person in a broken world, yet I want to do the best I can to live my life for Jesus and to have an expression of my faith upon my face to point others to the Lord Jesus. Thomas Jefferson said, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. If you resist evil things, it's obedience to God. The psalmist said in Psalm 97, verse 10, you who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He does, delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And then Solomon in chapter 8, verse 13, the phrase says, the fear of the Lord is to what? Hate evil. Solomon says, do not take your stand for an evil thing. You see, it doesn't matter who you please if you displease God. And it doesn't matter who you displease as long as you please God. Let me say that again. It doesn't matter who you please if it's displeasing God. And it doesn't matter who you displease if it's pleasing God. You see, the wise man is in the expression of his faith. His determination is to stand against evil. But secondly, his determination is expressed through discernment. Discernment. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Young people, Solomon is talking about rulers, those in place of authority, your boss, your parents, the governor of a state, the president of the United States, whether you agree with them or whether you don't. And Solomon is saying that those in authority, that, uh, that, 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 that there's going to be a reckoning day coming, and if they don't make the right decisions in their governing, they have a higher power that someday they're going to stand in uh, authority to themselves. A, a wise ruler's judgment is made with the day of God's judgment in mind. There's going to be an accounting one of these days. Let me tell you, they will give an account to God. Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So Solomon says the wisdom a man is seen not only in the expression on his face, but also in the expression of his faith in his determination to stand against evil, in his discernment to know how to judge rightly and to be the right kind of ruler and uh, authority. And then thirdly, uh, man's wisdom is also seen in his dependence. Listen to what Solomon recorded in chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. For he does not know what will happen, so who can tell him when it will occur? No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war 
and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. He says, there is no release from that board. Let me tell you, a wise man lives day by day, totally dependent upon God. What a difference God makes in a person's life. Can you only imagine this morning, as we were singing a few moments ago, I saw many of your faces light up as you were singing, looking at that hymnal, and I thought to myself, what would people do this morning if they didn't have a church to attend? What would people do this morning if they didn't have God to count on, to depend on? Let me ask you, what are you depending on in your life? Who are you counting on? Who are you depending on? Young people, let me tell you, God is a faithful friend. He is one who forgives. He's one who forgets. Let me tell you, Solomon describes life. He's been on a journey. He has been journaling every day in his journal of the good things and the bad things and what he's learned and the mistakes that he's made, the challenges that he makes day by day, week by week, year by year. And he realizes he's been on a wrong path for a long time because trying to live life under the sun without God is a meaningless life. It's a hopeless life. It's a life that has no purpose and no fulfillment whatsoever. And so today he speaks to us about the wisdom of man. But secondly, he speaks to us this morning about the wickedness among man. Notice in verse 10 and 11 of Ecclesiastes 8, Then I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity because the sentence, and here is a very important statement. Solomon said, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. No wonder in our world today, no wonder evil prevails No wonder evil is exponentially expanding all over the world. In our justice systems, people are put on for years and years and years and years. And people look around and they go, well, you know, if they're not going to be prosecuted for the things they've done, if they're just going to sat there on death row all these years and and, uh, judgment's not going to be brought against them, then, hey, I'll just go out and do whatever I want to do. And so often in our justice systems all over the world, we, we get bogged down and broken down in all the red tape of things. And uh, judgment is not executed speedily. And therefore, to those that would be perpetrators of the evil, it just encourages them more and more and more to go out and live life recklessly and live life uh, to uh, fulfill their evil desires. And as young people look around in the world today, no wonder we see so much problems in the workplace, at at the schoolhouse, all of these things, just because God has delayed his judgment doesn't mean that God has forgotten about those judgments. There is an accounting day coming. Notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 9, verse 16 and 17. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And then notice verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. One of these days, one of these days, God, through his son Jesus, is coming back to this earth. God is going to bring judgment down upon this world. Now, I want you to think with me this morning for 2,000 years, For two millennia, for 2,000 years, Jesus has tarried his coming. But Jesus has not forgotten. 
because Jesus looks out over the balcony of heaven this morning and he sees what's happening. There's nothing that misses his gaze. He looks down upon a world that is filled with evil, wickedness, idolatry, sin, hatred, jealousy, murderings, envyings, all of these things. But let me tell you, just because he has tarried his coming does not lessen the fact that God's word says that he's coming one of these days to mete out judgment upon this sinful world. Now, I want you to notice something here about the wickedness among man. There is the cause, the cause of some wickedness in verse number 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is what? It's fully set in them to do what? To do evil. Solomon tells us that's the cause uh, because they look around and say, well, you know, I, I can get away with this sin and I'll just continue to do the sins I'm doing. Well, the Bible says... Be sure your sins will find you out. And then not only is the cause of the wickedness, but there's the curse of all of the wicked. Notice verse 12 and 13. He says, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Let me tell you, you and I look around in our world today and we may say, well, I know some pretty wicked people and life looks pretty great for them. They seem to be prospering. They seem to be doing well and uh, there is pleasure in sin for a season. But folks, let me tell you, It won't last forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 4 says, For God will bring what? Every work. Where? Into judgment. Including, get this, every secret thing, whether good or evil. When Keith sang that song a few moments ago, I could not help but think, I'm thankful today for God's wonderful gift of grace. I'm thankful someday when I stand before him at the great judgment seat of God, and that's for all the Christians, I'm grateful I won't stand there to be judged for my sin because my sin was covered by the blood, and he's forgiven and he's forgotten. What he will judge me for is what did I do with my life from that moment I got saved at age 12 years old? What I, what I did from that time until I meet him in, my pres- in, in the presence of the Lord. That's what I will stand at the judgment seat about is to give an account of the things I've done for him in this life. I will not be giving account of my sin. The Bible said he has forgiven it as far as the east is from the west. And I like what Bertha Smith, the great missionary to China, said many years ago. He posted uh, a sign in the sea that says, no fishing. In other words, you don't fish for my sin, I don't fish for your sin. If you know Jesus, he forgave them. He covered them, and they're forgotten. And even though Satan this morning is still accusing you and me before God. Let me tell you, Jesus sits there saying, I paid the price for his sins that day at Calvary. I'm grateful that I will not stand to give an account for my sins, but I will give an account for the works that I have done. Did I do what I needed to do for him while I was in this world from the moment I received him in my life. But let me tell you, the rest of the world, those that are lost, are going to stand at the Bema seat, 
which is the great white throne judgment for all of the lost of all of the ages. And they're going to stand there, and the Bible says the books will be opened. Do you know God keeps books? He has ledgers. And what that means is a lot of them thought, well, you know, I'm a good person. I've been a good philanthropist. I've given millions of dollars away. And let me tell you, people like Bill Gates, people like Warren Buffett, and people like Elon Musk, and all, we could go on and on and on with all of these billionaires that are out there unless they have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus all of their millions and trillions and billions they'll give to human causes will not earn them a place in heaven. The Bible says you must be born again. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You see, if you don't go to Jesus by the way of the cross through the shed blood of Christ, you don't go. And the great white throne judgment someday will be where all of the lost that have ever been born in this world are going to stand. He'll open the books and all of their goodness will not get them into heaven. He'll open another book. It's called the book of life. And he'll say, your name is not here. Your name is not here. Folks, let me tell you, there's a judgment day coming someday. And I want you to know, unless you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you'll stand at the great white throne judgment and be consigned forever, separated from God for all eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. Jesus spoke more about hell than he ever did about heaven because Jesus knew there were going to be multitudes of people that would go there. There's another thing there about the wickedness among man. There's a commendation that is given. We've looked at the cause. We've looked at the curse. There's a commendation among the wicked. He just says in verse 15, so I commend enjoyment. You know what Solomon is saying there? Because a man has nothing better under the sun than to what? Eat, drink, and be merry. You know what Solomon was saying, young people? While you're in this world, if you know Jesus, you got to come out from among them and be you separate. You see, you can't live like the world, look like the world, and be pleasing in Jesus' eyes. Because if you know Jesus, like Solomon, he veered off, he backslid, he went down the wrong alley. But I want you to know when we get to chapter 12, you'll see what he had to say about living life. I'm grateful this morning, I'm thankful that the book of Romans says in chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Let me tell you, if you've got a grudge against anybody out there, you've got to forgive them. You have to forgive them because God in Christ has forgiven you if you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. You may say, well, well Randy, you, you have no idea what so-and-so did. It doesn't matter what so-and-so did to you. Doesn't matter what so-and-so said to you. Do you want to stand at the judgment seat of Christ where your sins will not be judged because they were judged at Calvary? Do you want to stand at the great white throne judgment for the lost of all of the ages where he will say, depart from me? You that worked iniquity, I never knew you. The Bible says there will be people that will say, well, we cast out demons in your name. 
We healed people in your name. The Bible says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Folks, there will be people that have sat in church many, many years, but they never had a born again personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let me tell you, you don't have to avenge yourself. He's the great avenger. He says, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. And one of these days, he's going to close the curtains upon this life. But let me tell you, he can make a difference if you know him, if you trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful because I realize I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of Almighty God. I realize that I'm no different from anybody else other than the fact that there was a day as a 12-year-old kid sitting on the second seat on the right-hand side of a little church called Loco Baptist Church. And I remember when Dr. Sam Scantlin was preaching that Sunday evening in the absence of my pastor and the Holy Spirit tugged at my heart and I walked down that aisle and I want you to know Jesus has made all the difference in the way I try to live life. I'm not perfect. I will never be perfect until that which is perfect is come. And I'm in his presence. But I'm thankful to grace, God's wonderful free gift to a world out there today that absolutely rejects him and pushes him out of the mainstream of everything. What a sad time is coming if they have to stand at the great white throne judgment and here, depart from me. I never knew you. Folks, it's a sobering thought. But every day, my face shines because I have the joy of Jesus down in my heart. And it's down in my heart to stay. Amen. Would you stand as we pray together? If you've never met Jesus, don't go away today without knowing him. If you need to come to the altar and pray, if you need to make a decision there in the pew or to come and join this church, you let the Holy Spirit lead you. And whatever decision you make, God knows about it, and that's what matters. Amen. Would you bow as we pray together? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, God, for this time when Solomon lived 3,600 plus years ago. But oh God, what he had to say was relevant then, it's relevant now. Thank you for what you teach to us. Oh God, speak to some soul today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.